Hello, everyone. Welcome to another round of Quick Fire Questions. We're with Professor Ian Campbell, uh, Associate Professor at UC Davis. So, Professor, with Quick Fire Questions, basically these are 10 questions, both history and non history based. Uh, just kind of answer the first thing that comes to your mind. So, uh, Dan, you have the questions. Uh, let him go. All right. Question one. Is there, is there an underrated book of history that should be read? Anybody who hasn't read Absolute Destruction by Isabel Hall um, is, I think, really cheating themselves in terms of understanding not just the way the German army worked um, in the late 19th or early 20th century, but understanding some really important things about uh, the way that war works more broadly in military culture. Um, and it's so thoroughly researched. Um, that's, I don't know if that has become a classic yet, but that's one, that's the recent book that for me is most likely to become one. Um, 100% agree. I literally just packed mine away, getting nice. ready for a move today. <laughs> There's a picture of me um, with my son on my lap when he was about six weeks old. He's in like the bumper pillow and I'm reading Absolute Destruction. Um, <laughs> Appropriate. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Uh, uh, next right. one, Dan. Question two. What are your thoughts on the 1997 hit film and family classic Anastasia? And was Rasputin really a wizard? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I have to undo so much damage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Rasputin was not a wizard. He was he was good at hypno he was good at hypnosis. Um, uh, Anastasia died in Yekaterinburg. Um Disney movies are fine, but they're for kids. <laughs> Anastasia, yeah. Anastasia, like very much, did die the same terrible death that the rest of her family did in Yekaterinburg. Like, I, I don't think that works for a family film, does it? No, <laughs> no, that would be, that would be <laughs> also, it also doesn't work because it's not a Disney film. Oh, it's not. It's, shoot, it is a Don Bluth, uh, I think, 20th Century Fox film. But it's on Disney Plus now. So does it count? As, is, he, is she Disney princess now? Ooh, that's a that's now a hard one. <laughs> uh, My mistake there. She's a, she's a corporate princess. We'll go with that. Uh, all right. Question three. Like. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, question three. If you could witness any historical event live, which event would it be? I've always been so impressed. You might have heard this. Um, I've always been so impressed by that sound clip of the moment the guns fall silent on the Western Front at the end of World War I. And I would like, I would not like to have been there too much before um, because I'm a coward, <laughs> but um, I would That's like cool. to have been there when the guns stopped firing and you heard the birds again and to be around people experiencing that. It's a pretty cool moment, I have to admit. Uh, next one, Dan. Uh, as a student of history, historian, and especially as a grad student, you have, a, you have to read a lot. What is one tip that you have to stay on task and continue reading? <laughs> this is the big one for me. <laughs> I mean, your notes ready, Eric. Yeah. I, I, I find that you really have to, like, <laughs> you have to treat yourself like a lab rat or something and, like, switch up the motivations that you get that you're offering yourself. And one thing that I do is, like, I try to switch myself fairly regularly between like task orientation and uh, clock orientation, right? So some days it's like, okay, I got to read for three hours before I can do anything else. And other days it's more like, okay, read a chapter, go for a walk, read a chapter, like 
spend 10 minutes on Twitter, like just kind of vary the stimuli that you're getting. I think that that's very, I think that's very important. And also I think to vary the kinds of reading that you do, that's another way to keep it from feeling like Gregory. Spend a lot of time in primary sources, read outside your field some. Um, um, I mean, so also like everyone, this is the part where everyone probably says, you know, learn how to gut a book. Um, I don't like gutting books. I like the details. Um, so this is the Thank way, you. this is the way that I do it. Um, if, yeah, if it I do. It wouldn't matter. They wouldn't be in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm more like read for 10 minutes with on Instagram or Twitter and then read for 10 minutes. So I'm going to have to change minds up a little bit. We'll see how it goes. That sounds like a good idea. I'll try that out for my next. Yeah, or like, you know, I'll do like, you know, an hour, an hour of book and then like I'll do like language practice for 20 minutes. So I'll, you know, like handle emails for 20 minutes and then get back to it. Like, yeah, actually, it's, actually. it's just about you, you can do quite a bit as long as you're varying, varying the stimuli that you get. At least that's been my experience. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. Next one, Dan. Question. question five. Is there a Russian dish that everyone should try when when and if they decide to visit Russia? After especially, the war over. especially after the war is over. <laughs> I, I am I am one of the more passionate defenders of Russian cuisine. You will find it is um, unjustly sh unjustly slandered. Um, um, one of my favorite things to eat are uh, Siber Siberian pelmeni. Um, there are these little garlicky dumplings with beef or lamb or pork in the center, um, ground. Um, they're about so big um, and. You can serve them a few different ways. I really like them, you know, a bunch of sour cream and dill, um, you know, maybe like a nice, maybe some pickles on the side, um, shot of vodka. You really can't go wrong. Um, how, do you, oh, yeah, go. How, how do you spell this dish? Pelmeni, um, the Siberian, I think you got. Pelmeni is P-E-L-M-E-N-I. Got you. And uh, is, are potatoes used like in every dish? It's a pretty yeah. starch heavy cuisine generally. So yeah. potatoes sometimes, but you know, also like you know, you, you'll get like just a lot of starch. Like if you go to get like a cafeteria meal or something like that, it, you might get potatoes, but you also might get, you know, bread or buckwheat or pasta or something like that. Um, uh, I mean, potatoes are important. Potatoes were actually introduced contrary to the stereotypes. Potatoes were introduced relatively late to the Russian table. Mm -hmm. Like they've come into broad they came into broader use during the late imperial and soviet era for the same reason they did other places they were they're calorically dense easy to grow keep for a long time um but it took a long time to kind of you know they're part of the columbia exchange right and it took a long time for people to actually be convinced to grow them interestingly there was also an experiment you know trying to find different nutrient dense things that work in cold climates that peasants could grow um they also experimented in the 1830s, believe it or not, with quinoa. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but that was way less popular. <laughs> I, I only ask because I know I'm from my my dad's from Nicaragua, and so I went and visit the country. Like dried bananas are used like in every single dish. Yeah. Like, yeah. So I was wondering that's. Yeah, that's I mean, yeah. Pot pota potatoes are common, but not, um, <laughs> not quite in everything. I would say. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Since we're on the subject of potatoes, uh, I am German, and we have a lot of potatoes in our dish. Um, there is a weird factoid I learned where a lot of German farmers for a long time refused to cook with them because they thought they were earth demons, and they would go to hell if they ate potatoes. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. And then there are other things, you know, like, you know, turnips or rutabagas, like, I, yeah, I remember in the discussion of, you know, kind of famine diets or like ration diets and World War One's like, why are we eating those? That, that's what we feed the pigs. Like, exactly. Six, why does Russian society choose to consistently support authoritarian leaders uh, such as Tsar, Stalin, and Putin? This is the question from the people, so. They haven't been given a lot of options when you can when you when it gets right down to it. And, you know, nobody really asked them like, "Hey, how do you feel about having a czar?" Um, and they quite famously had you know some revolutions to try to not have a czar. Um, um, and you know, there were plenty of uh, forces attempting to you know kind of counteract the Bolshevik takeover of power as well. People who were looking at more democratic paths to socialism. Um, so you know. Menjuviks or socialist revolutionaries or people like that. Um, 
And, you know, both in, after 1991, um, you know, both Yeltsin and in turn Putin worked very hard to eliminate any kind of viable alternative to them, uh, to themselves and to uh, delegitimize elections. So, you know, Ru Russians have never really been provided with with what you, with what I would consider like a choice, um, um, a choice that is actually legitimate. And and sometimes Putin, for example, wins elections because precisely because of the way he's hollowed out the political system. Like when you look at like the candidates who are standing next to him in some elections, like okay, who are you going to vote for? Um, you know, Putin or the owner of the New Jersey Nets or um, well, the Brooklyn Nets, I guess they are now or, um, you know, a member of the Communist Party, which is, you know, now a very different thing and is essentially like a system party, or uh, Zhirinovsky. Zhirinovsky is now dead, but he was this kind of, you know, far-right clown figure, um, Russia's racist uncle, basically. Um, so, like, right, some, some people have supported Putin in the past, not out of any particular for him, but because, like, that's what's been on the table. And I do think... I do think sometimes when we talk about kind of the kind of tendency toward dictatorship or one party or one man rule in Russia, it tends to really efface the efforts of actually existing Russians to create different systems, um, both in the imperial and in the Soviet eras. Um, I see, I see. Funny because they're that's also how their con their constitution is written in favor of a very strong president. Mm -hmm. that would give presidents lots of power, lots of ability to do stuff unilaterally, which then further enables them to change the constitution to further make things unilateral decisions and so on, which you know, self-perpetuating cycle and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Question seven. Uh, when somebody asks, what do you do, either in an airplane or fa similar family gathering, what do you say to them and what is their first reaction? I mean, so I, I tell them that I'm a professor um, in the University of California system. Um, you know, then they will typically ask, okay, professor of what? And I say history, Russian history. Um, um, oftentimes that's where the conversation ends. Um, <laughs> um, but then all, you know, pe people will, generally people are curious and people will like will, will like take that opportunity to try to find out a little bit of more about like some current event which is associated with russia um or something like that you know right now obviously it's a lot of conversations you know not as wide ranging but similar to this one right um yeah yeah I, I think people have a reasonably good most people have a reasonably good understanding of what professors do i think they tend to think that we teach more than we do and research less than we do yeah but I think that most people have a good basic understanding of that. Yeah, whenever I tell I people I do history, I'm like, man, like that must be a lot of reading. I'm <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, but I mean, I enjoy it though, so I guess it's Yes, okay I chose it on purpose for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I would rather interact with this book than with you. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Number eight, what is okay. the last song you listen to? Uh, no, what it would have been is that, you know, last night I was playing Mario Kart with my son, and uh, <laughs> then afterwards I pulled up, you know, some of the Mario Kart music on my phone while we were playing afterwards. My son is seven, um, so, and frankly, um, most music written for the Nintendo Wii goes much harder than, like, many other things I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Really. I mean, like, earlier in the day it was, like, classical music while I was drawing, but the last thing was... I think the Coconut Mall soundtrack from <laughs> That's a very unique answer. I think the last time we asked it, we asked uh, Professor Zientig and he said uh, for the Mickey Mouse Club uh, Yeah, theme. Mickey Mouse Club theme yeah. out. His son is three minus seven, so it's just a little bit. <laughs> uh, number nine, what did you do to learn the Russian language? Um, God, what didn't I do? Um, so I took three years of classes in undergrad, um, formal classes, and then two more in graduate school, um, including a summer abroad. Um, so I've had quite a bit of formal training. 
Um, at that point, after having five years of a language, you've like exhausted anything that anyone can teach you about grammar or anything like that. Um, so at this point, what I do to, you know, what I, what, since, you know, about 2007 was my last formal study of Russian, what I do to improve it or maintain it. Well, I mean, it used to be that I tried to go there frequently. Um, currently, that's a non-starter. But you do, you have to expose yourself, I think, to as much original material as possible. So, um, you know, I, there are a couple of friends who I still, I write to exclusively in Russian. Um, you know, colleagues I have, you know, in Russia or in Kazakhstan. Um, I try to consume, um, I try to read news. Um, you know, obviously my primary source work produces a lot of, uh, you know, keeps me familiar with different kinds of grammatical structures, new words, etc. Although that's mostly like 150 year old Russian. So sometimes I sound a little stilted when I talk, if I, yeah. if I use a phrase that I learned in one of my readings. Yeah. Um, I mean, I also, there's a decent sized Russophone population um, in the Davis area in Sacramento, most of which is actually from Ukraine. Um, and so I do sometimes when I'm driving, I listen to the Russian Russian language radio station, just to try to keep that in my ear. Um, and then the other thing is like, when you are fortunate enough to be in country and immersed in your target language, um, the, the thing that I think this is actually applicable to any kind of language study, um, you have to really understand that like, language immersion is not a magic trick like it is not like i will go to this place and i will just kind of by osmosis absorb the language or something no but what it does do is it gives you an opportunity to make your heart thick so, which is say like it was much i picked up so much more when i was like doing my summer classes in st petersburg you know six hours a day and then like able to walk around notice things notice signs hear people say things that it reinforced much faster and i had this stupid We're read a couple of articles right. and made flashcards with all the words i didn't know so hard work is great um no yeah matter, yeah no yeah matter what the approach is definitely i've definitely. been i've been i've been battling with the russian language for about 20 years now one way <laughs> or the other so yeah well i think it's about your winning so <laughs> yeah definitely uh no. depends on the day <laughs> well, Fair enough. last question what is one misconception about history or historians you would like to dispel i i don't know that i want to dispel this totally but i always cringe when people talk about how we need to do history okay are you guys frozen again are you no, hearing me? I, no, I we're, hear good. You. we're good. Sorry. I always cringe when I hear people talk about the importance of doing history so that we like learn from our learn from the lessons of the past and don't repeat them. Um, I loathe that way of thinking about history. Um, I mean, of course, it's important to understand context for things, but I I get worried that that's a very presentist way of thinking. Like, if, if we're trying to understand the past in the sense of how it's useful to us, instead of trying to understand what people at that time did and thought um, and how and how it was to them, like, that, that's not the kind of history I'm actually all that interested in. I want to, like, I want to immerse myself in the past and understand it on those terms, rather, and if it happens to provide useful context for the present, so much the better. Um, I see. The one, the one that gets me is that like history is not important. I'm just like just think about all the things that's going on now, especially with Black Lives Matter and the yeah. perception of race. It's like that's why you need history. It helps you yeah. understand a lot more things. Yep, yeah, and, so. and and I do understand like this is part of how we make the case for ourselves. And so, but I, I think maybe I, I kind of think of it as a kind of code switching. Like obviously, when I write grants, it's like oh yeah, you got to give me money. It's very important. You'll never understand the world unless you fund my project. But I also, I hate thinking about the past that way. Um, I, I hate the idea that like, the past is valuable because of what I'm bringing to it in my concerns. Mm, I see, that makes sense. Hate is maybe a bit of a strong word, but like that, 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 those expressions have just always kind of created on me. <laughs> I got you, I got you. Hi everyone, Eric here. If you enjoyed this quick fire Q&A video with Professor Ian Campbell, then be sure to check out the podcast to do with him. The video can be found in the eye above or in the description below. Thank you.